morning and welcome. We want to welcome you to worship with us here at University United Methodist Church for our virtual worship this first Sunday of October, October 4th. Today we're going to be continuing in our sermon series, our worship series about um, overarching stories of the Bible called Inspired, um, which takes a look at how God's grace is at work in the story of scripture um, in each time and in each in each place and how the story of scripture is one continuous story of God's grace at work in the world. The particular story we'll be taking a look at today is the birth of a nation, um, the story of how Israel came to be a nation and some of the struggles related to that. So we invite you, um, as you begin worship with us, uh, to take a moment to download the bulletin, which was found in our email blast, or is in a, a button on the website, or in the link in the Facebook section, comment section, to download the bulletin and join us so that you might share in our prayers and our songs um, and follow along, see the beautiful photos that are in the bulletin. We also invite you to take a moment at the same time to um, check in uh, let us know that you're present and joining us. Let us know if you have any particular prayer requests. We do pray for these each week um, with our prayer call. And so we want to make sure that um, you take a moment and check in and let us know you're here. As we begin our worship service this morning, I invite us to just take a deep breath in and a deep breath out and to begin to remember what is most important, to be present to center yourselves. And as we do that here, uh, we are gonna take a moment and light our candle. If you have a way to create some holy space in your, in your house, perhaps that's by lighting a candle or by being in the same place as you, as you join us each week, we would invite you to do that. And as we light our candle here, remember that we gather around the light of Christ. We're connected to one another by this same light. Let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Gracious God, you are our creator, our deliverer, king of the universe. You formed us by your hand in your image. You gave us life. You brought your people out of Egypt. You gave us hope. You, f you led your children through the wilderness and fed them with the bread of heaven. You give us all we need. You judge with justice and act in mercy. Our faith is in your reign alone. So we praise and worship you, O God, King of the heavens and earth. Amen. Please join in the singing of our hymn of praise God of grace and God of glory. It can be found in the United Methodist hymnal on page 577. The verses one and four are also in your bulletin. in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that our hearts and minds may be opened. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel. It's the 8th chapter, verses 4 through 22. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us, then, a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and the commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his office and his courtiers. He will take your female and male slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to their voice and set a king over them. Samuel then said to the people of Israel, Each of you return home. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for this day. We ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds, Open our ears and open our spirits that we might hear the word that you're speaking to us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Around three years ago, for my birthday, I received an amazing gift. Two tickets to the much acclaimed Broadway musical, Hamilton, written by Lynn manuel Miranda. I know that many of you, most of you, maybe all of you have heard of it, but at the very least, a year ago when I mentioned it in another one of my sermons, it's a musical written about the life of American founding father Alexander Hamilton. For me, some of the most enjoyable and hilarious moments of the show were the King George numbers, in which King George came onto the stage by himself, dressed in his royal attire. He barely moved an inch the entire time, but with such amazing facial expressions and incredible song lyrics, he captured the audience and sent them into throes of laughter. I invite you, uh, if you have not heard the three songs that he sings in the musical, to make sure you, you Google them and listen to them later. But I have to confess that in my head today, this sermon comes against the backdrop of King George's songs from Hamilton the Musical. One of the songs comes shortly after the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, as the American colonies were winning and just won the War of Independence. So King George comes on stage and sings a letter to newborn America, wondering how they will succeed on their own. The song is called, What Comes Next? Which I seriously considered singing for you today, but I promise I won't. It goes this way. What comes next? You've been freed. Don't, do you know how hard it is to lead? You're on your own. Awesome, wow. Do you have a clue what happens now? Oceans rise, empires fall. It's much harder when it's all your call. All alone across the sea, when your people say they hate you, don't come crawling back to me. Now this song, although it's tongue in cheek, talks about the chaos of the birth of a nation, which is where we find ourselves in scripture this morning. Now today, I have to say, we're making quite a leap from last week where we took a, a look at the exodus of the people from slavery in Egypt to today's scripture where we're seeing the very end of Samuel's time as judge. There's quite a bit of territory we're missing out on. And so I wanna give us a brief summary of the in-between period um, to bring us to the scripture that we heard this morning. Bookwise in the Bible, this covers mid-Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and First and Second Samuel. So last week when we left, the people had crossed the sea and they were finally free, safe from the Egyptians and the Pharaoh. God was the great deliverer, providing a way where there seemed like there was no way through the parting of the sea. The Israelites then go on a journey through the wilderness and God establishes a covenant with them. This covenant, which is grounded in God's steadfast love, known as Hesed, includes the Ten Commandments and provides a completely unique model for an alternative community in the ancient world. Israel always falls short of the ideal and the vision, but they are striving to live out a grassroots up type of structure rather than the hierarchical structures of other nations at the time through pharaohs and kings. The goal of this covenant with God is always the wholeness, the shalom of the entire community and the people's commitment or responsibility to keep the covenant is to keep it by living out the values of righteousness and justice. The books of Numbers and Deuteronomy expand on the laws and create lots of law codes which show what it looks like to live out the covenant with Yahweh and one's neighbors in more detail. Now the next series of books share the story of how the Israelites enter the promised land. No longer are they wandering around in the wilderness. Now, if you read these books in detail, you will notice lots of little discrepancies in what they did and how and when and how many people were there already. 
In the book of Joshua, there is military activity with what seems to be an exorbitant amount of destruction and people killing other people and death. You might remember the famous story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, for example. But in others, there are conflicting accounts of how the Israelites entered the land. Sure, there's certainly entrance through military encounter, but in others, there's entrance through bonding with peasants in the land and their rebellion against Canaanite overlords. And in other accounts, they enter through assimilation and economic alliances. Regardless, in these books of the Bible, there's a lot of conflict. And a lot of, of that we could unpack at a different time. But that is not the theme of this sermon. For the purposes of this message, the people are already in the promised land. They have entered. And when Joshua's reign ends, we enter into what's known as the time of the judges. Now, during this time, the people are facing two important national crises. An internal crisis, who will judge and lead and how will they be governed? And an external crisis with the Philistines, who are constantly a threat to the existence of their newly formed nation. As the Israelites live out their covenant with God, periodically, special leaders called judges are raised up to help fight battles or to settle disputes as they are needed. But it's not very stable or consistent leadership. During this period, there are cycles that start to repeat over and over again. The cycle goes something like this. Israel begins to prosper. The people forget God. They follow other gods. Their enemies begin to overwhelm them. The people cry out to God for help. God sends a redeeming judge, someone like Deborah or Gideon or Samson. Then there is peace and prosperity for a time before the cycle begins again. The cycles in the book of Judges seem to spiral bigger and be, become more out of control, more chaotic as time goes on. The last of the Judges is Samuel. Although Samuel is sort of a bridge, he also operates in the role of the prophet and priest. The end of Judges leads us to a complete breakdown of order with these lines from scripture. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The covenant was God, with God was forgotten. Whew. Well, I know that was a whole lot. We just blew through six books of the Bible, and we might not understand the context fully, but without reading our situation too much into Scripture, we know something, do we not, about what happens when systems that were meant to help govern and lead a nation, a people, break down. We are, to a certain extent, in a similar moment in our country. In the time of Judges, the breakdown leads to the book of Samuel and our Scripture for today, which creates an opportunity for Israel to change its governance structure and its kind of leadership. To move from a covenant community with part-time judges who help lead in critical moments to a monarchy. Her scripture picks up with the elders of Israel gathering with Samuel, the prophet, the judge, the only leader in town who is left. Samuel is aging and his sons are useless and wicked. The elders of Israel point out to Samuel his advancing age, how his sons will not be good leaders for their future, and they ask Samuel to appoint them a king to govern them so that they can be like other nations. Now Samuel thinks this is a horrible idea, but he prays about it. God tells Samuel to listen to them, but to also solemnly warn them and show them the ways of kings and what they are really like. Samuel goes back to the elders and he warns them that no good will come of having a king to rule over them. His speech of warning is dominated by the verb to take. Kings, all they do is take and take and take. That's how they operate. 
They draft people, they institute taxes, they use their enormous power to take from the people for their own needs. Samuel warns them that unlike the judges who were chosen when there was a need for them, the kings will always be present, whether they are needed or not, and they will demand luxury and service at all times. Well, the people do not heed this warning. They again emphasize their desire to have a king and to be like the other nations. Their expectation is that a king will solve their problems, especially their problems with the Philistines. They want a war leader. They no longer want a judge to lead a battle for them, but they want someone who can raise them up an army. They want continuity of leadership. The people whom God had delivered and set free are now voluntarily giving up their freedom to a king who will use them as he sees fit. Samuel even goes as far as to warn them that one day they may cry out to God and God will not answer, since this slavery will be of their own doing. Here is the crux of the matter, Israel is wanting to be like other nations, but they are not called to, to be like other nations. Israel is meant to be a holy nation, a word which simply means set apart, different, distinct. Their calling, going all the way back to Abraham, is to, to be a blessing to all the families and nations of the earth. They are God's chosen possession, an instrument of blessing, they are not meant to be exactly like other nations, and, and this desire for a king means that they are moving away from their calling. Samuel reports the people's reaction to God, and God here makes it very clear that the institution of a monarchy is wrong, but if the people insist, then it will happen. Here we see the tension that is brought up by the grace God offers us. God will not force God's will on us. God respects human freedom. God ends up telling Samuel to listen to the people and to give them a king. It's a time of national crisis, a time with a failure of leadership a time in the shadow of judges, a time when the nation is warned that those who have incredible power, like kings, will be corrupted by that, will think of themselves, their luxury, their wealth, and they will take and take and take to maintain that power. A time when the warning is that a certain kind of leader will have the power to serve them instead of serving the people. Well, sorry, will have the people serve them rather than serving the people. A time when some people believe that having a king amounted to a sin against God, and others believe that a king would be God's anointed. Though these are imperfect comparisons, can we not see hints of our own time in this chaos reflected here? We're talking about judges and the shadow of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death and who will be appointed to our Supreme Court. We're talking about leadership transitions in the middle of a national election in which the current president won't promise to turn over power if the other candidate wins. And it's a time when people have very strong, completely opposite opinions, not about the monarchy, but about the current president. What I love about coming to scripture is that just as much as there is core testimony, there's also something called counter testimony. That means that scripture might show us one thing as the norm, but then something that contradicts that completely is also shared and preserved in scripture. This story about Israel and the asking for a king is certainly negative. But it's also true that there are scriptures that suggest that kingship might not be all bad. In fact, the very next chapter in 1 Samuel chapter 9 is positive about kingship. God says about Saul, the man that Samuel is to anoint king, anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, 
for their cry has reached me. Now God may have agreed that they may have a king, but God did not agree that the king should be like the kings of other nations. The king that God would allow them to have must be God's Messiah, a word which simply means God's anointed one, God's chosen one. Even kings may be redeemed if their trust is in Yahweh instead of their own power. Truly, both points of view about kings have been preserved and passed along here in Scripture. And here in the positive view of kings is the beginning of the theology for a Messiah. These scriptures are where hope is planted for a Messiah, where we see the idea grow that the kingdom we are all part of will be God's kingdom guided by God. Once again, in response to the people, to the time in which they lived, to what was going on around them, we see God pivot, God's grace at work in this time and in this space opening up and flowing through another channel, another opportunity and way to connect with the people and to lead them. Kings may now be allowed for Israel, but they must be a different kind of king. They're not to impede upon God's sovereignty. They're not a self-justifying center of authority. Kings must be designated by God and anointed by God's prophet. They must be empowered by God's spirit and affirmed by all the people. They must demonstrate the power of the spirit in mighty deeds, in the ways that they live in the story of their life and rule. Kings are still, in fact, subject and accountable to God. We see this truly at play after Samuel anoints Saul as the first king of Israel. This first experiment with kingship with Saul fails miserably, as shortly after, God rejects Saul as the king and then has Samuel anoint David as king instead. God will give the people a king, but it has to be on God's terms, not human terms. Now David's kingship, for the most part, succeeds. David is called a man after God's own heart, David, the king that we know most about from scripture, and indeed the person in the Old Testament that has the most written about them, is perhaps the closest to living out this definition of king. But we know that even he messes up royally, which means that there still is and always will be a need and a role for prophets, which we'll talk more about next week. So after all of that, how does this story matter for us today? What is God speaking to us in this moment? We live in a society where kings are not appointed or anointed by God. We live in a society where we get to be part of the election of our leaders. But I think Samuel's warning to the people matters for us too. Ultimately, our hope and expectations for a good and just life cannot be placed solely on a political party or a political candidate or political system. Our highest allegiance can never be to a political party or politician. The people of Israel clamored for a king, thinking that by having a king, all would be taken care of for them. But as we know, leaders, just like kings, or a mixed bag. In the end, as we see in scripture, some of the leaders will seek after God most of the time and do some wonderful things, but even these will not be perfect. And some of the leaders will do great evil, leading the people down enormously destructive paths, which we will also see. So is the story of kings. And I might add, politicians, and probably all leaders. Instead of centering our hopes on a leader, we must place God at the center. We must remember that we are called to be people who are holy, set apart, not like other nations or other people. That we are called to be a blessing to all the families and nations of the earth. Our calling is what 
God told Moses back in Exodus, right before God gave the Ten Commandments and created the covenant to tell the people, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As the people of God, we are to be holy. We are to live differently, according to the covenant of God, living out justice and righteousness. And we are to be a nation of priests who mediate, who bring about love, who reconcile differences, who restore harmony, who make peace, shalom for the whole community, who intervene and intercede the love of God to all people. This is our calling, not just to pin up our hopes or allegiance to the outcome of this election or to one candidate or leader. Our calling is to keep striving, each one of us, for a more just and loving society and country. Our calling is to be a blessing to all people, to mediate love, to be a nation of priests, to work from the grassroots up to uphold justice and righteousness. This is who we are. May we live out these values every day. Thanks be to God. May it be so. Amen. As we come to our time of offering today, and which is also our time of music ministry, where we're blessed by the gifts of many in our community and those um, that we're connected to virtually, um, we would invite you, if you haven't already, to give to the church um, as generously as you can. Um, there are many ways to give online or through mailing a check or initiating it through your own bank, um, but we invite you to give sometime um, this week if you have not already done so. We also would like for you um, to let us know if you will need or want um, offering envelopes. Some, pe some people are mailing those to the church. Um, and so if you will want them for 2021, we know many people are giving differently or electronically. Um, we need to have a count of who would like those paper envelopes. So please let the office know about that. Let us be in a spirit of prayer as we listen to our music ministry today.
As we prepare to go from this place, there are many opportunities for connection and service to share with you that are also found in your bulletin. So I do hope you'll take a moment to look at those. Um, as always, on Sunday at 11.15, we have Sunday School where we go deeper into the scripture um, on Zoom. Um, and so you're invited to drop in and join us for that. We also have our weekly prayer calls Wednesday at noon. Um, Next Sunday, October 11th, we will have our second outdoor prayer and communion service. Um, our first one was a wonderful time of being together. We invited people to bring chairs for our lawn and to socially distance, to keep masks on, and then to have a short uh, service about 30 to 45 minutes of prayer and communion and listen to a string band at the same time. Um, this coming um, Sunday, we would invite you to register, which we need to be prepared for people. Um, there will be a link to register your presence. We also invite you, if you would like to, to bring your own communion elements. Um, you are welcome to do that. They will be blessed at the same time as, as others. Um, but we will also still have prepackaged communion elements for anyone who does not want to bring their own. Um, you are able to do whichever way you prefer. Before our time of prayer and communion, our children's Sunday school will also have their class on the lawn at four o'clock. Um, so we invite you uh, to register for that if you have kids or grandkids who would like to come so we know how many to expect and how to prepare. Finally, you'll see some other announcements in your bulletin about our All Saints service. If there's someone that you would like to honor and in memory of this, this year, uh, we would invite you to respond to that announcement. Um, we also invite you to come to our church conference, which will be virtual in October, and the dates and information about how to do that are in your bulletin. Finally, just invite you to take a, a look at the sign of hope for this week um, and hope that that's a sign of hope for you all. And as we go from our, our separate ways this morning, we do invite you to find a way to share the peace of Christ with one another. Um, and also with those who live in your homes, your family, your friends, um, those who are on your blocks and in your neighborhoods. Um, take some time to share God's love and grace and peace today. Now receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>